Tonight, Detroit's emergency manager Kevin Orr joins us for the latest on the city's bankruptcy and beyond. Plus, Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan's six-month promise, has he delivered? It's all coming up tonight on My Week. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaround-plan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there and welcome to My Week. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christy McDonald. Tonight our focus is on the city of Detroit, an in-depth look on where we are in the bankruptcy process, what needs to happen next, and what can we expect in the next several months. How Detroit emerges from this sets up the state's largest city for the next chapter. Joining us tonight is Detroit's emergency manager Kevin Orr, along with our My Week contributors Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Gentlemen, it's always good to see you. Kevin, welcome back to My Week. Thank you for having me, Kristen. I know that you've been in, this has been such a busy time for you, especially these last couple of weeks before the vote right. on your restructuring plan. Before we jump into that, and we have a lot of time to do that, right. I want to step back and I want you to first reflect a little bit on the grand bargain right. and what it took to get through that process. Uh, grand bargain's tremendous. I mean, uh, Judge Rosen and his team of mediators, uh, Miriam Nolan, uh, uh, the group that came together, Ford, Kresge, Kellogg, Skillman, all of them that have thrown in is, is just tremendous. I don't think sometimes people recognize what it means to have $820 million given to you. Uh, the single largest for at least several of the organizations, single largest donations they've ever made. So it's a tremendous help and it's something uh, we did not have six months ago. Would you think that we'll ever see anything like this in the scope of a municipal bankruptcy? I don't think so. I, I mean, it's, it's so unusual and so extraordinary to have almost a billion dollars dedicated solely to pensions. You know, without that money, uh, the potential cuts to pensions would have been very drastic. So I just don't think you're going to see that again. So that sets the table for where you are right now and right. asking the pensioners to approve this restructuring deal that you have on the table right now that they have to vote on up until July 11th. Where do you think that you are right now? Well, we're, we're actively trying to get the vote out for both the retirees and the actives. Um, the actives have to vote yes, too. And it's, it's really pretty simple. You know, with this $820 million that we have coming in, that means that the cuts will not be as severe. If you vote yes, you get the proposal we have in the plan. If you vote no, you get 30% less for the rest of your life. And so it seems pretty obvious to me, you know, we, we never borrowed money from the pension fund. We never made any investment decisions. All this is additive that has come into the city, both the uh, commitment from the foundations at 366 million, the state's commitment and value of 350 million, and the DIA benefactors of 100 million. I mean, that, those are huge sums of money to correct a problem that was supposed to be corrected in 2005 when we borrowed 1.4 billion. So vote yes, you get the proposal, you may not like it. Vote no, you get 30% less at least uh, for the rest now, of your life. Do, some of the retirees may think that this, the grand bargain will be there regardless of how they it vote, that there's a chance to come around a month from now and, and get a better deal. Mm -hmm. Does all that money, state and foundation, does all of that go away if they vote no? Absolutely. Every I, I want to be very clear about this, Nolan, because I, I think you're absolutely right. Some people think, oh, we'll, we'll be able to do a better deal. No, no, no. This has been baked into a plan that's in mm -hmm. a federal court process. If the condition of each of those contributions, state settlement, the foundations, and the DIA, is that there be a yes vote on the plan. Okay. No vote, it all goes away. And putting it back together would be... Impossible, you think? I, I, I think, I think first of all, uh, it'd be tremendously difficult. Nothing's impossible. Mm -hmm. you know, we sent people to the moon, so nothing's impossible. I think it'd be very difficult. I think there are people, even within the organizations that supported this, who have cautioned against the hazard of making this kind of contribution. We'd be validating their concerns. And I think our financial creditors in the bankruptcy, as you all have been reporting on, you know, consistently about sort of their positions, I think it would validate the opposition they have to the plan and their perception that they're being treated unfairly. So you'd be not only harming yourself personally, you'd be giving ammunition to the opponents of the treatment you're supposed to get. It's, there's no value proposition to voting no. Uh, 
even if the pensioners approve this, you still have to go to court <coughs> yes, next month and uh, and make the case right. for this this deal, which is unusual. I mean, it, it, it takes pensioners and the art <coughs> and sort of puts them aside in the bankruptcy, which is right. which is not the way municipal bankruptcy is really supposed to work. Right. How confident are you? that Judge Rhodes will see this the way you do and say this is all okay. I, I take nothing for granted and I think people really do, that's, that's very apt Steve, and people really do have to understand we've got two big milestones. Just because we get the vote, which is the first one, doesn't mean we get confirmation, which right. is the second one. And the judge is, as you know, the judge is hearing from other parties who are getting, you know, 10 cents, 5 cents, 12 cents on the dollar and they're saying this is fundamentally unfair. Right. It's unfair discrimination to me as a creditor in the same class as the pensions. They don't care if they destroy this deal. They'd rather do that and have the city sell off everything, the water department, the art, and they think they'll get better out of that. In fact, we found out there was an effort by the financial creditors to make common cause with some of the retirees early on mm -hmm. until the retiree groups recognize this isn't a better deal for me. Right. So they've been trying to find a way in and we've got to defend that in front of Judge Rhodes and he's got a heavy lift. I mean he's got to go through all the evidence. He set aside almost a month, a month of time for to the trials it, sure. to hear it. Um, so I'm not confident, I'm not taking anything for granted. I'm not taking the vote for granted and I'm not taking the confirmation hearing for granted. Well I if Judge Rhodes says no, right. what happens? Well, we go back to the drawing board. I mean, and that would be, as I, as we said, if we got to know there, it's unclear that all the money would be in. Certainly, part of the no could be a result of the financial creditors having made their case that they're being discriminated against unfairly, right. unfair discrimination, which is a standard we have to meet. But where's your wiggle room there? there? I mean, I mean, if you if you have to go back and the arts off the table because of the grand bargain. Uh, where's your wiggle room to satisfy these creditors? Nolan, it might not be off the table now because if well, the, then the, the grand bargain fares, goes away. The grand bargain goes away. So then, the very thing that some of the financial creditors want is a yard sale. Hmm. Let's sell everything. Of everything. You you guys have heard. They've been very <laughs> clear. They went out and got some some buyers say, hey, I bid this for the Art Institute. It's v the strategy is not in debate. It's very clear, and that's why I say to the pensioners and the actives. You need to get by the first milestone, which is voting yes. We've still got to get through the second one, even with your yes vote, against some of our financial creditors. Because when you say go back to the drawing board, that to me s sparks an entire timing issue. So then w what are we looking at there in terms of time and, and length of time that this could drag on for? Well, it's indefinite because you're going to have a defense of a failed plan. You'd have to try to restructure something and renegotiate. And people need to understand all the plan of adjustment is is a series of settlements okay, with all of our stakeholders, with, with AFSCME, with uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, other uniform unions, uh, DPLSA and all these other, all, that's all with some of our financial creditors, which we're operating under now. You know, the swap settlement, we're actually paying that down as we go forward. You'd have to unscramble all of these eggs. All these settlements are conditioned upon approval of the plan of adjustment. It'd be a mess, a big mess. So we, we're trying to make our case. We're try we need the support of the pensioners and the act of duty. So at least we can make our case in court that we have the support of the very people who are benefiting from the $820 million. You know, Lord helps those that helps themselves. If they don't help themselves, that's going to be a hard case to make. Uh, there has been some concern this week from active employees. Let's talk about what's going to happen for the people who are still working for the city of Detroit right now mm -hmm. in terms of their pension. Mm -hmm. And on June 30th, right. uh, the, the old pension system is going to be frozen. Yes. Explain maybe what some of the frustration is that some of the workers are having right now with this new plan. Well, I, th I think there's several, and, and some of it is, is understandable. For years, we had a defined benefit plan, no employee contribution, and the city promised you that they were going to pay you a pension. Mm -hmm. Um, over the last 10 years, for instance, that plan actually made 5% rate of return, but the city promised double, 11.1%, okay? In other words, the city promised twice as much as the plan actually made. Cities can't do that. It's not just us. It's in Rhode Island. Um, there, there are issues going on about moving away from defined benefit. Some cities have gone to pure defined contribution. In other words, no city obligation, just you have a 401k and you make your contribution. We did a hybrid plan, which is 
the employees now have to make a contribution, a hybrid defined benefit plan, but the city will match or exceed that contribution into the plan. So a lot of the actors are like, wait, wait a minute, I never had to make any contributions. You're right, and that's why the plans were underfunded. But now you make a contribution, the city will make one that's greater than yours, so in the years to come, you will have a defined, uh, hybrid defined benefit plan matched to a real rate of return, and the rate of return is 5.2% at least. If they make more than that, they get to keep it. Under no set of circumstances can it go below zero. So if they actually lose money, in 2009, for instance, the GRS fund, uh, alternative savings fund, lost 19.7%, but the city guaranteed 8%. That's a 27% spread between what they actually lost and what they were promised to pay. Now we have a 0% floor, won't go any lower, so people will contribute, but the city will match. Now we did that. And a lot of people, a lot of professionals, a lot of municipal finance experts said, you're crazy, everybody's getting out of the defined benefit business. Everybody's going to a strict 401k. We said, let's be a little bit better than that so the general fund still has an obligation to employees, but make no mistake about it, it is a change. Now, Kevin, when this process started, the thinking was that Detroit's bankruptcy would establish the presidents for municipal bankruptcies all over the, the country. Mm -hmm. Do you see it playing out that way? You know, no, I've, I've, I've tried it consistently. In fact, I think uh, one of the first uh, Ed Board meetings we had, mm -hmm. that question was raised, and I tried and continue to try to stay away from saying that this is a precedent for anything. Each city is different. Um, each tax base is different. Demographics are different. Their relationship with the state is different. You know, for instance, in California, we have the California employment system coming in and filing an, an amicus brief against our plan because they don't think that should happen in California. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty strong testament to how they feel this is not a precedent. So I've tried to say, look, I'm, I got blinders on. I'm a draft horse going up the hill, pulling this way, okay? <laughs> Whatever this means for anybody else is beyond my obligation. But it is on the mind of the national unions you're negotiating with. It, it, I think it is, but I, but I think the Detroit situation is so severe mm -hmm. and has been coming for so many years. You know, Albert Cobo in 1931 left Burroughs Corporation to become the acting treasurer um, to deal with Detroit's financial instability. <laughs> okay? That was 83 years ago. 83 years. And he stayed there from 1931 until he died in 1957 as the treasurer and as the mayor, the mayor. dealing with <coughs> Detroit's instability. This has been coming for 83 years. We need to fix it, reset the table, and go forward. It doesn't get better for us. Other cities, Chicago, New York, New York has some of the most expensive real estate in the world and one of the strongest tax bases in the world. It's, it's, the, it's the cradle, crucible of finance. Chicago has a lakefront. So I can't analogize anything we do here to those cities because they're all different. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, we know is happening as a result of the bankruptcy is it will free up a lot of money that we were spending on debt and right. uh, pension obligations and things like that to spend on city services. Uh, and you made a, uh, a, a big point when you got here of the need to, to provide better services to, to people who, who live here. Where are we in that process, and, and do you feel like uh, Detroiters are starting to see that happen, or is that still to come down the road? Well, I'd, I'd like to think they're starting to see that happen. You know, I'm, I'm charged with the financial balance sheet restructuring of sort of up here, but at right. the end of the day, most citizens want safer streets. You know, they want the garbage picked up. Right. They want the lights on. And you're starting to see that working with Mayor Duggan. The lights are going on over 500 a week are going on yeah. in the city. Or 40,000 are down. Our garbage collection, we got, got an email compliment from a citizen the other day who said, you know, I originally was against the uh, 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 privatization of garbage collection, but your guy came by and, you know, when some of it dropped out of the can, swept it back up into the clan or, uh, can and, and cleaned up the city. Uh, our financing for our quality of life loan uh, was at 3.25%. You know, I'd never, the city hasn't had that in decades, had that rate in decades. Well, you mentioned um, so. Mayor Duggan, and we're going to be talking in a few minutes about his six first six months on mm -hmm. the job. Uh, has he been a good partner for you in this process? You know, I, th I think we have a, a, a partnership that is mutually respectful. Um, it is, 
you know, it's not necessarily warm and fuzzy. Any mayor wants his or her city mm -hmm. back, okay? Nobody wants the emergency okay. manager. I get that. How many times a but day do you talk to him, or is it we, a week? We, well, we see, talk to each other several times a week, but we see each other regularly, and we have a standing meeting that we have. So we have regular discourse, and our staffs are working together quite nicely because, you know, as I said, when the mayor came in, our interests are aligned. We want the same. We all want the lights on. We all want the garbage picked up. We all want the water department to work. We all want uh, rates, uh, crime rates to go down, and they are 20% year over year. Target adjustment is down 12%. So we're moving in the right direction. I would say one thing about that, and people want to look at it as six months. You know, Eric Holder, the attorney general, said something at the federal meeting we had last year. He says, you know, people need to understand if it's taking you decades to get here, you need to manage your expectations going forward. 83 years, and we're starting to sell and remove homes and get lights on in six months, but it's going to take some time. You talked about uh, lighting and transportation and blight, and those are things that the mayor has really kind of spearheaded because those are the things that are under his control. Right. The police chief still reports to you. Yes. Are you satisfied with what the chief has been doing in terms of response to crime, um, crime prevention? Yeah. Are you pleased so far with what's happening with the police department? I, I think we should. When you look at statistics in every category, violent crime and others, year over year and on a uh, three-year trailing average, we're down in double digits Okay, in crime. Now, the average citizen, you know, and I've talked to some policing experts, the average citizen's perception lags the statistics. They're trailing indicators, as they call them. So people may have a different perception, but statistically in every category, carjackings, violent crime, homicides, we're down, even though some of the reports have spurts of crime, like other cities, we're down. The only area that there's been an uptick is in domestic violence, and we think that's because people are actually doing the job and taking reports and for the first time, probably in the past decade or so, the police force is using ComStat to actually track accurate reporting and get that information out. So yes, I'm satisfied. That being said, clearly as we move towards what I hope is the, the end of my tenure, we'll have to have a transition plan back to the regular order. And the reason the police chief reported to me was restructure the department, but under the new charter, the police chief serves at the pleasure, or pleasure of the mayor, but he reports to the police commission. So going back to the regular order is going back to both. Yeah. And, and I just wanted in a very short, he hasn't been here a year. A year, he hasn't been here a year. And in a very short time frame to restructure the department, which everyone, including the police monitor, said needed some restructuring, he's taken that bull by the horn and has done a tremendous job. Now, you've worked very hard to avoid this whole mess ending up in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Yeah, we're trying. As has the, the bankruptcy court. Right. Uh, assess the likelihood of this going to Cincinnati. Anybody can take an appeal, and some people have already said they're going to, and I suspect some of our financial creditors, mm -hmm. because I used to be on that side in the private sector, uh, are, are looking to do that. In fact, they filed a motion to remove the stay from one of the appeals is pending. So they're, they're going to, presumably, unless we reach a settlement with them, and we're open to doing that, I want to be clear. We want settlements with everybody, um, even those who, who think I'm the devil incarnate. Um, but anybody who has a filing fee can take the appeal. The whole thing in the case is to make sure that we make our case strong enough at the confirmation hearing that it would survive an appeal. Having a yes vote with the beneficiaries of that $820 million says to everyone that the settlement was approved by the creditor group. Having a no vote opens that up, as well as some of the settlements we already have so to appeal. So how long does an appeal delay this whole thing? Y you know, Nolan, um, in the Chrysler case, we went from uh, the bankruptcy court through the Second Circuit to the U.S. Supreme Court in five days. Mm -hmm. Okay, But that was extraordinary. Sure. That has never happened in the history of mankind, certainly Anglo-American jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't anticipate we would have uh, that it could take weeks, months, or years. Hmm. Your time is coming quickly to an end. Yes. The, the uh, city council can vote you out at the yes. end of September. Yes. That is beginning of October. Mm -hmm. People are asking what will happen, though, if the bankruptcy process is not done by that time. Well, we're, we're going to have to jump off that bridge when we get to it. Um, I, I am hopeful that because the majority of the plan are a series of settlements that were negotiated through the mediation, and I think people really need to appreciate and understand how important it was to have Judge Rosen and his mediators really bring the parties to the table, uh, what would have been a very uh, confused and chaotic process and reach all these settlements. I'm hopeful that because they're settlements and they're coming in and the standard of deference in the court for settlements is pretty good, that that support 
will come in in time before I have to leave. If it doesn't, we'll have to address that issue when we get there. Um, certainly the, the state statute gives the council and the mayor certain rights, and I don't want to speak to how they might decide to exercise those rights. Hopefully we'll get it done and we'll never have to confront that. All right. Kevin Orr, Emergency Manager of the City of Detroit, thanks so much for joining thank us thank on My so Week. Much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Turning now to the six-month promise Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan made to residents when he took office. Give me six months, he said, to show that his administration can tackle the city's problems. How has he done? Our partners with the Detroit Journalism Cooperative, Bridge Magazine, Michigan Radio, and WDET Radio have all focused reports on this six-month mark this week. So let's go ahead and take a look. Gentlemen, uh, is six months, when he said that at his uh, address, it was like, well, he kind of threw it down and said, don't do anything, don't go anywhere, give me six months to show. Has he delivered on that promise? No, I mean, it's still inconclusive. He hasn't been in charge in six months. He's been partially in charge. So, I mean, his ability to influence events in Detroit has been limited by the emergency manager. And, you know, Kevin Orr st still has uh, most of the power, most of the control. What you can say he's done in six months is, is sort of restored confidence to a certain degree among, among city residents. I think people do believe that he can do the job and will do the job when his time comes. And I think people sense, get a sense of motion here, which is important. If you're, if you're asking people to, to stay, to stick it out, to wait until things get better, to stay in these neighborhoods where their services still aren't great, they have to believe things are getting better. And I would think that's his greatest accomplishment in these first six months is he, he has given them that sense of motion and progress. Bold on his part to give that six month promise knowing full well that he has an emergency manager and six months really isn't a lot of time. It's not, it's not nearly enough time to, to really change the reality for people in the city, but I mean, I think uh, Nolan's right. I, I sort of see it as him setting up the framework to be able to make things work better in the city. And I think you can see a lot of signs of that, the people he has around him, the way things function uh, in this administration, just his doggedness. Uh, you, uh, you talk to anybody who's had to deal with him uh, and something he wants, something he wants done, the, the, the relentless way he goes about getting that um, is very different uh, than what we've had in City Hall for a really long time. And so I think once he does get control, those things will, will help enormously uh, move, move the ball. You also have some important uh, uh, sort of framework coming from other places. This uh, blight removal task force mm -hmm. uh, report is a huge step forward in cataloging what what we're looking at when we when we're looking at this city of, you know, so many empty structures and vacant lots. Uh, there's money now behind that to start taking stuff down and cleaning it up. Uh, he's got the Detroit Future City report that can help shape what those neighborhoods will be like. Uh, afterward, I mean, I think th he's poised to be able to move stuff uh, quickly, but but it's still going to take um, it's still going to take a long time before your average Detroit resident can say, "Wow, things are really really different." And he, he's um, been smart in that he's not swinging for the fences. It's not a home run game. Yeah. Singles and doubles, moving right. around the bases, getting uh, things accomplished uh, a little at a time, as you. As you mentioned, he's done and he's done these home auctions, mm -hmm. small things that people notice, and it makes a difference. It makes residents feel like, hey, he's got ideas and he's got the skills to do this, yeah. um, rather than big pie in the sky initiatives that people have no confidence in. How is his administration different from others that we've seen in City Hall and Detroit City Hall? Well, I mean, one thing you hear from people who work down there is. Uh, again, this this accountability that that <laughs> strange word in Detroit City Hall, you know, uh, a couple people who've worked there through several administrations have have told me that, you know, with with past mayors they might ask you to do something or ask you about something uh, on Monday and you wouldn't hear about it again for several months. Uh, they say if. Duggan asks you something on Monday, uh, the next Monday he comes back and says, what did you do with this? And if it's not done, you know, he, he gets after you. Um, that's a huge change and that kind of management in City Hall is going to get the most out of a workforce that is depleted, number one, uh, underskilled, uh, number two. 
um, and and really needs uh, you know a push to get to to, the, to to better service delivery. And he's going to have to move forward pretty quickly though once coming out of this bankruptcy process to help rebuild the city to get that tax base going to get people to move into the city yes. which is going to be key. Last 20 seconds final thoughts. Well, yeah Nolan. growth is key and then six months is too is not enough time to change a culture and what has to change at City Hall more than anything else is not process it's the culture it's the mindset of the people who go in to work every day you're still hearing stories about people saying they can't get through the bureaucracy I think he'll take care of it but that's going to take some time all right gentlemen thanks so much it's always good to see you and that's going to do it for my week for more on this six-month assessment story from our partners with the DJC please go to our website myweek.org we will have all the links right there for you and that is going to do it for my week thanks so much for joining us have a great weekend and we'll see you next week take care Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michiganturnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta.